maybe the problem is this idea of selfishness. It's I want my need is not getting met, and I'm trying to meet it somehow, some way, and I make the money, I make more than you. It kind of comes back to this idea of me trying to meet some need because I don't feel secure in the relationship. And money's kind of like fuel in the fire. Hey, Matt, I was thinking the other day, you're a couples counselor. So the majority of your work is, I'm, I'm making this up, the statistic, I'm going to say what, like 75% of your work is with couples. Yeah? Something like that. That's right. Ish. 75% ish. Yeah. And as a counselor, I'm also going to make an assumption here. And if it's wrong, call me out on it. I'm making an assumption that the majority of the couples that you're working with are coming to you because some issue has presented itself in their relationship for the majority correct uh, there are and I, I know you do some premarital counseling that's right. And, and that's right so it's a little bit more proactive counseling but the majority is is some issue has presented itself and in some cases the couples are trying to resolve it in some cases maybe they're trying to find some amicable split that's right and you're throwing it to the middle of this okay so as a as a financial advisor, I read a lot of things and we've had these conversations that money is oftentimes a, uh, a problem in marriage relationships and some stats and I've heard it thrown around a couple different ways. They say that money's a, a leading cause of divorce. Yeah, it, it's significant in some way. People dispute exactly what it is, but certainly money is really significant in relationships. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to say that the majority, again, if I'm making some false assumptions, call me out. I'm going to say the majority of the, cust the customers, the clients, your, pay, your, your, how do you refer to your clients? Clients? Clients. Clients. Majority of your clients are coming to you because some issue has presented itself. And I'm going to say that the majority of times, possibly money may not come out as a specific issue, but from time to time it does. Exactly. When it does come out as, as one of the issues that's presented itself, what would you say is the, the top issue specific to money? Probably, I, I mean, you know me, I always have long answers for your questions, but, uh, to kind of to, to try to keep it brief, I would say the primary issue has something to do with they don't agree about how to spend, use, or manage the money. And they and when they try to talk about it, it goes off the rails. So it's a, it's an issue of spending. Could you? Uh, I'm curious, could you share maybe like a, um, obviously you can't share specific situations that you've had with clients, but elaborate. We have all, I got nowhere to be. I'm, I'm good, man. I got all afternoon, so you don't have to be short-winded. I've got a lot of questions and, and you like long answers, so we're good. Don't hold back. Okay. So what was your question? A, uh, an example of. Yeah. Spending, so you say typically problem? it's an issue of spending. Yeah. Elaborate on that for me. Uh, so picture a couple that um, is making money. Uh, both partners are earning money, um, but they disagree on exactly how much of that money is mine to spend at my discretion and ours to spend together. Um, and if it, and the portion that's mine, do I have to account to you for that? Or, or can I just it's mine. I earned it. I get to spend it the way I want it. Um, so that I, without going into real specifics, I think that's kind of a general version of the problem is how much of our money is actually my money and how much of our money is our money and how much of our money is your money and disagreements about expectations around that discussing that and and uh, particularly the, 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 the dollar amounts we're talking about. So is it, is, it a, um, is it more of a disagreement 
in maybe a vision of how we should spend it or is it is it legitimately a disagreement in this is mine not yours and i want to maintain um, I don't know, control i want to maintain yeah. um autonomy over over what i have earned yeah both i mean both uh so it could be kind of philosophical differences you might see those earlier that tends to come up earlier in the the life of the couple you know we realize pretty early on we just have different beliefs about money we use money differently we think about money differently we learned about money differently um and we, we're recognizing that some of our differences clash with each other. Um, there, there also is the case of like, we, I've been used to earning money. You've been used to earning money. Now that we're combining money, hmm, how much of this is still my money? There's that kind of an issue. And then for, for cut more established couples who are often making more money, um, there, there kind of is a sense of, oh, now we have more discretionary mon money how much of this can I just blow on a boat or new tennis shoes or a night out? So it, it, it manifests itself in a variety of forms. Yeah. So it seems like, it seems like uh, maybe, maybe the, maybe it was an unfair question when I first dated in terms of like the top issue, because it just seems like there are multiple issues that you just presented there. And, but they all seem to kind of come back to this one idea of, let me see how I can, how I can phrase it almost, almost like a, a self centeredness. Like it's my money. It's, it's an expectation that I have. It's almost like seeing, yes, there's us, right? There's this relationship. It's me and you, there's us, yeah. but it's almost still seeing as two separate parts. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, at, you know, we're all about building us. And so there certainly is the concept of us. And most people in relationship would, would say, I'm all about us. I'm, I'm for us. I'm interested in us. But there's still a part of us uh, as humans, as partners that, that think about me. And so that you know, where those two things meet and overlap, us and me, um, really, really is important for couples to think about. And it, it's not a static line. It might be one thing when we're dating, another thing in our first few years of marriage, another thing after we have children, another thing later in life, that line between me and us, I and you, uh, you and us, certainly shifts and moves and morphs through the, uh, through the life of the relationship. That sounds complicated. It does. It is. R relationships sound complicated. They are. They are. It, in some way, they're beautifully simplistic in the sense of we all want them. We all pursue them. We all need them. Um, we need each other. Uh, and so in that way, they're beautifully simplistic in another way, like the nuts and bolts of making it work day after day, year after year is wonderfully complicated. So let, let's, let's pause for a second on this uh, idea of that they're beautifully simplistic. What do you, I, I like how that sounds. Mm -hmm. That sounds beautifully simplistic sounds beautiful. How are relationships beautifully simplistic? Well, as I was saying, just the fact that um, we want them. We're, we're kind of driven toward relationship. I, as an example, I can remember my first day of kindergarten. Really? I can remember my first day of kindergarten. And if you think about that, essentially that, that's all about relationships. I'm being walked down the hall by a, a parent whom I'm in relationship with. I'm not quite wanting to let go of their hand because I, I feel comforted by them. We walk into the room, my, my kindergarten room, and guess what? There's, a, there's tables and chairs out in the room. And sitting at one of the tables is one of my childhood best friends. And he, he gets my attention. He calls my name and he says, hey, Matt, come over here. 
I saved you a seat. That's cool. And I'm able to let go of the hand that I'm holding, walk yeah. across the room, and sit down with my, my buddy. It's all about relationships. And that way, they're very simplistic. They help us feel comfortable, comforted, and, and encourage us to go out in the world and do amazing things. We all need them. We all pursue them. In that way, they're very simplistic. Another way they're simplistic is that to have more of us, it generally takes a, re a relationship. And so to have, go ahead. To, have, to have more humans on the planet, it generally takes yep, relationships. <laughs> Um, and so in that way, they're also very, simple. you didn't learn that in kindergarten though, right? That wasn't, that wasn't science <laughs> was, classic. Yeah. No? It was an advanced kindergarten, right? It was, <laughs> I, I just, what I remember in kindergarten is eating the clay, eating the Play-Doh that we made out of sugar and flour. That's, <laughs> I learned, I learned the color maroon. I learned that I couldn't take naps. Yeah. That I hated a nap. That's what I learned in kindergarten. No, I do like that idea. And I, and I think that you brought up a really good point. When we think about relationships and this idea of building us, we think about the couple relationship, maybe the marriage relationship or the, or the, uh, uh, the spouse relationship. But you just brought up um, two important relationships, friendships, and then also uh, like a, a parent or a familial relationship. And as, you're, as you were talking about the, the beautiful simplicity of, of relationships, I was thinking about this idea of security. It's almost like we find security in relationships. We do. Uh, we find uh, fulfillment in relationships. And I would argue that even, even as a financial planner, financial advisor who talks about money all the time and talks about financial security, I would, I would make the argument that true security doesn't come from money, but it comes from the relationships that we have, um, the people that we are secure in, yeah. the people who support us and encourage us. Yeah. Um, and, I, and so when you were asking about uh, earlier, like money being a primary problem in couples therapy or couples counseling, you know, the statistics that you sometimes read about money being, one of the one of the top three things people fight about or something like that you're right in that really what we're needing and fighting for is security and money becomes kind of a, a symbol of that and a battle battleground for that how we organize how we make organize and spend our money becomes an exercise in security are we going to be okay Mm -hmm. Do we have enough to pay for this month and next month and the month to come? Um, and so money, money is really kind of a, a, a thermometer of part of the couple's overall sense of security. Hmm. It's interesting. Okay. Um, so, so money is like a thermometer of security. So the less secure I am, in my relationship, the more problematic money becomes and the more secure I'm in my relationship. The Oftentimes, let me just give, let me give two examples of that. So number one, if I'm feeling very insecure in my relationship, like I'm not trusting my partner, let's say I'm not trusting you as my, as my friend, then I'm going to be more secretive about my money. I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to hold it more close to the vest and not let you know what I'm up to with the money, like how much I make, how much do you make? Mm, how much do you need? You know, we, we, we become more coy. Less trusting. Our, yeah. 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 Because we're less secure. So that's number kind of number one. And then number two, if we're feeling more insecure in the relationship, we're probably going to spend money in a way that benefits me rather than mm -hmm. us. So yeah, it's kind of like anytime society's dealing with a scarce resource, which, you know, sounds like insecure, it's scarce, mm -hmm. then people tend to hoard it. People tend to, you know, like uh, hand sanitizer and toilet paper and right. meat. Exactly. Yeah. Those three things in particular, hand sanitizer, toilet paper, and meat. Right. <laughs> yeah. So hoard those things. 
So I want to get back to spending in a second, but I want to go back to this idea of beautiful simplicity of relationships. Cause as, as, as we, as we've been talking, I've been kind of trying to get a picture of this and you hear all these stories about marriages or relationships. It's, you know, when we got married and maybe you hear your parents tell these stories, we had no money, or maybe you tell these stories to your kids. We didn't have any money, but like we were in love and things were, things were not easy, but like things were good. Yeah. And then what changed? What got complicated? Is it, is it we accumulate stuff? Is it the addition of other humans in our life, i.e. kids that are complicated and pose a different challenge to relationships? Um, but your, this idea of, of relationships being beautifully simplistic, if you think of if you're in a relationship in, in, a, in, a, in a romantic relationship, you think about the, the, the dating days, the early days and the excitement. Right. Uh, and it was simple. Nothing mattered. And then yeah. we, we grow I, and mature. I, I think there is a reality that we, we need far less money and other material resources to be happy than we think we do. And so, you know, for a lot of young couples, when they're, first getting together and they're, they're in love, they may have less money and less material resources and they can still make it. They can still really, really enjoy each other and really find a lot of fun and happiness. And as we age, we tend to want and even need more material resources for sure. Um, but I, I also don't think that young couple, they, they can't survive without money and material resources. Nice. So you can't, you can't live on love alone. I mean, somebody, you got to eat something. Is there a country song? I don't know. What's the country? But is there a living like, on love or something? Sounds, sounds like a country, country song. song. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, it, relationships are simple in that, um, in, in that they, they don't require a lot of material resources to work. I mean, just mm -hmm. think about, successful relationships across the globe around the planet and throughout history i mean we're talking now billions of successful relationships that are indiscriminate of the amount of material resource that they that they possess or have access to that being said i mean there's something really important to be said about having a certain meeting a certain threshold of minimum access to money and material resource does make the the relationship more secure and more more uh enjoyable so like if you're you know at or below or well below the poverty level you're um you're at real risk for not for for really struggling and really uh enduring and sustaining some some real injuries to the relationship once you know once you kind of meet a minimum standard of money and material resources then you're not that much more objectively happy if you go well above that number so there is kind of a, a cutoff point where everybody everybody needs a certain amount of money and the, the resources that come with it to be happy, but also safe and secure. It's, it's interesting. You're talking about this idea of the level of money for, in terms of happiness. There's actually, there's actually been studies mm -hmm. on this. There's one that came out, I want to say back in 2018, I, I just pulled it up here. And the conclusion was um, the ideal income for individuals, um, is let's see it's, it's 95,000 in the US, 000. Right. In the US is, right now yeah it's not, a psychologist it's go i'm going to i'm going to name a college that that you might you might uh, cringe at here uh psychologist from Purdue University and the University of Virginia Ooh. yeah it's not Virginia Tech but University yeah. of Virginia uh, a world gallup poll from 1.7 million people in 164 companies uh, countries and cross reference their earnings and life satisfaction so although the cost of the cost and standard of living varies across these countries. Researchers came up with a bold conclusion. The ideal income for individuals is 95,000 a year for life satisfaction and 60, 60 to 75,000 a year for emotional well-being. Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, families and children, of course, will need more. So there's this idea that a certain level of money does 
uh, provide emotional well-being. I'm going to guess because we need to eat, we need shelter, we need clothing. I mean, these are some basic medical care, medicine, we need medical I mean, care, ac- yeah. access to things that make us feel secure, not just luxuries. I mean, I'm not, not talking about just really nice sets of sheets. That's not what I mean. I mean, an actual place to sleep. Yeah. And, and then above that, there's no direct correlation to our happiness. Exactly. So money, money does buy happiness to a certain point. Yep. And then beyond that, and maybe that's the beautiful simplicity is that there, there is only needs so much to be happy. Money, right. And then if you're in a good relationship, a healthy relationship, that's fulfilling in and of itself. And if you're in a bad relationship, you, you can't have enough money. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, um, oh gosh, I don't know who said it. Different people have said this in different, different ways, but the idea is financial security to have the, the, the best, the best type of financial security you can have is the ability to do with less, <laughs> mm. right? The less you can do with, uh, or, or, or the more you can do without the more financial security you'll have because you won't have to, uh, I'm not advocating here one second. I don't want anyone to, to misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not advocating that money is bad uh, by no means. And that, that ambition should be stymied by, by no means. Um, but this idea that, Hey, if I lose my job, but I need $150,000 to maintain a lifestyle, I'm in trouble. Yeah. Right. But if I lose my job and I only need $50,000 to maintain my lifestyle, it's a, it's a whole lot easier to sustain. Right. There's a lot more and, security in that. And, and with that security comes a sense of, of, of peace and we can do this, we can make it, we can make it together. And that, yeah. that's, in some way, that's beautifully simplistic. So we're looking at this in the context of, of, of relationships. If I can do with less, this idea of, of young couples, this idea of we're living on love, this, this beautiful simplicity. But the reality is we throw money, which is complicated. We throw selfishness into the mix, right? We may come into the relationship unequal from a, from a, production standpoint from a, what do I bring financially to the relationship? I bring debt. I bring bigger income. All these things complicate, start to complicate the relationship. Yeah. And, you know, to go back to your original question about ways in which money kind of manifests as problems in counseling. uh, Another way it does show up is when people feel like they're not getting a good bang for their buck, pardon the pun, they're not getting, (laughs) you have to elaborate on that one. (laughs) They're not getting um, a good value for the relationship or for their input in the relationship. They feel like they're giving a lot more than the other person is giving. I'm Um, earning all this and you're like spending all that. Yeah. And, and, you know, kind of traditionally, it might show up with one person say, I make the money, you know, I should get to spend the money. Or I made the money, I made this money, it's my mm-hmm. money. Um, and, and feeling like in some way, the contributions are unequal, and therefore unfair, and that there's a sense of injustice in the relationship that mm-hmm. I'm footing the bill for yeah. your life, your lifestyle, which is often how, by the way, often how parents feel about kids um it's less so when kids are younger although we're totally footing the bill for them and more so as kids age into their teenage years we start to feel some injustice about that but anyway back to couples so this is one way that it shows up in couples therapy and what i try to help couples to think about is not just who's earning how much money and is that equal? But I, I, I like to think about contributions. How are we both contributing to the health and growth and success of us? It takes a lot to maintain a life. But how are we both contributing to that? That's the, really the way that I like to think about uh, this equality kind of 
discussion. Yeah, so we, we kind of go back to the original question about when money comes up in, in, a, in, a, in a session where it's a problem in a relationship. Um, we, we, we kind of talked a little bit about different ways it manifests itself and this idea of beautiful simplicity. But the reality is at the end of the, at the, end of the day, when it becomes a problem, it usually has something to do with, and I guess maybe this is how we started off, where money is a problem, but it might not be the problem. Maybe the problem is this idea of selfishness. It's I want, my need is not getting met and I'm trying to meet it somehow, some way. Mm-hmm. And I'm making the money. I make more than you. It kind of comes back to this idea of me trying to meet some need because I don't feel secure in the relationship. And money's kind of like fuel in the fire. It's almost like, it's almost like fanning a flame. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, and I'm not knocking selfishness entirely. I mean, I, I think there's still a me separate from an us mm-hmm. and a you. And it, it's just finding the right balance where, where we can both get our needs met. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in couples work, primarily what we're working toward is I'm trusting you that I'm going to get some of my needs met through you. Mm-hmm. And, and when that's happening in a real synchronistic fashion, meaning we're, it's happening for both of us. Yeah. That's when that real sense of security develops. Yeah. So you're a couples counselor. You talk all day long about relationships and security and how to increase security in relationships. Yeah. I'm a financial planner. I talk all day long about money and managing it wisely and prudently and building financial security. And I think we both agree that if we don't manage this resource, this money, this resource wisely and prudently, it has the ability to not just have an impact and an influence on our relationship, but it could, it could damage our relationship. And not just, not just our couples relationships or spousal relationships, our other family relationships. Yeah. As business owners, if we don't manage it well, it can destroy and damage our business. And that's what really we're setting out to do is we want to have healthy conversations about how money impacts relationships so that we can be better at building our relationships whatever they may be. Yeah. So we can be better at building us, building whatever, us. That, whatever that is. This is going to be fun. I'm looking forward to, I'm looking forward to our conversations and I'm looking forward to fielding um, questions from uh, our listeners. I think that uh, uh, this is an important issue. I think that we're bringing together two industries that have traditionally not come together to tackle issues that I think that's important for us to come together and tackle jointly and not separately. Yeah. Love and money. Love and money. Invest in your relationships. Today is June 4th. When we're recording, it's about three in the afternoon. We would be remiss to not mention that a memorial service is taking place right now for George Floyd in Minneapolis. And we just want to acknowledge his life and his death and uh, all that that means right now in America. And we would like to say and acknowledge that for us, black lives truly matter. And black lives mattered to us last week before we knew about George Floyd and black lives will matter next week and black lives will matter next year and black lives mattered 300 years ago and will matter 300 years from now. And that both of us have dear friends who are uh, terrified about life in America right now, and we want to uh, acknowledge that we 
we love you, we care about you, and we stand with you. It's really bad. At the end of the day, it's about relationships. It's about the relationships that we value with our brothers and sisters of color who are African-American, our Hispanic brothers and sisters, anyone who um, has been marginalized, uh, those relationships matter to us. And right now, at this moment, on this day, our black brothers and sisters are hurting and, and we hurt with them. Dr. Matt Morris maintains an active private practice for couples and families in the greater New Orleans area. To learn more about his work, visit drmattmorris.com. Eric Garcia can be found online at plan-wisely.com. His branch office is located in New Orleans, Louisiana. The branch phone number is 504-218-5479. Securities offered through Royal Alliance Associates Incorporated, member FINRA, SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through New Century Financial Group, LLC, a registered investment advisor. Insurance services offered through Garcia Financial Group, LLC. Entities listed are not affiliated.